All right. Final talk. It's time for the closing keynote. And here at App Builders, we have a little bit of a tradition. Well, we have many traditions. We have the chocolate fountains. We have the beautiful locations. We have the great talks. But another tradition that we have is that there's a guy who is closing this, the whole thing, closing the conference with one of his really, really cool, excellent talks. And this guy, he's an, uh, is a great developer. He's been writing. He does a lot of things. He just told me he doesn't play the violin. In, but apart from that, he does it all. Um, please give a very, very warm welcome, closing keynote by Mr. Adrian, Adrian Kosmeski. Adrian Kosmaszewski. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so yeah, refactoring ourselves. Okay, so this is going to be a lightweight talk. It's kind of a finishing one, but I'm very happy because basically I'm touching a lot of subjects without knowing. I've been touching a lot of subjects that many of my peer speakers were speaking about in the past two days. So it's great because there's going to be a lot of connections. And uh, it all started because, you know, I, I use Twitter a lot for those of you. I even tried to quit last year. It was an utter failure. I actually love tweeting and sharing tweets and retweeting and everything. So basically, uh, it turns out that it's kind of a story, it's an unfolding story. So I took the decision this year to actually let Twitter do the talk. And, uh, and if there's somebody from Geneva right here, well, here's a, a greeting for you. And I'm going to talk five stories using uh, these elements of information. Um, and the first one is about the world, what we're seeing every day. And you know, the situation of the world is kind of complicated lately. Um, this is a very valid question, by the way. Uh, when I saw this tweet, I couldn't believe it. And actually, it turns out that Michael Moore himself gave an answer to the previous tweet a couple of weeks later, which is really, really interesting. And, you know, the whole situation, geopolitical situation of the world right now is really complex, you know? Uh, it's like new countries are popping up all over the place. And, you know, everybody's trying to figure out what's going on. And the whole thing takes the shape of, a, you know, it's like a new renaissance kind of thing. And everything looks like a painting from the renaissance. Otherwise, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of incredible. It's like, seriously, what's going on, right? Um, and, uh, but fiction is overtaking us somehow, which is unfortunate because we would have loved to have hovering, you know, hoverboards like in Back to the Future, yet we got Orwell. Anyway, the future is complex. We live in a complex world, really, really complex world. Uh, even driving a car can be something uh, that sometimes takes your mind out. And uh, then there's GDPR. As developers, we have to you know, implement a lot of things for GDPR. Uh, that was a, another thing that happened last year. And then you end up with things like this. Now you enter, you enter a website and you're basically shown a form of things you have to click and you have to agree with when you use the website, right? And even in real life. You actually have to prove that you're not a robot when you, you know, you rent a car. It's kind of, it's kind of complicated. And, uh, and you know, the, 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 this thing that nobody knows that you're a dog in the internet, it's over. This is, goes back to what uh, Guillermo was talking about a few minutes ago in this very stage. Uh, it's over. The NSA knows even your breed. And you know why? We need GDPR and everything because they want to sell you things. You know, they want to sell you like shoes here. And it's like, seriously, who? does that, right? Um, and, uh, and then there's Brexit, and my friend Graham, uh, if you're watching this, Graham, uh, we love you, and uh, you know, Brexit is happening, and it's an utter mess, and uh, there's, you know, countries, new powers popping up, so it's all reshaping in different weird ways, and China asking here countries in the Human Rights Council not to show up for discussions about China, and you know, when you look at the track record of some countries like China, sometimes, I think because of showing this, I'm basically killing all the chances of ever getting a visa to go to China right now. And uh, it's not only China, it's very sad what's going on because we make fun of these things, but it's actually very, very sad what's going on in many countries. And there's climate change. Climate change is changing everything. We are living in a moment in history that it's pivotal. Uh, whatever happens right now, it's going to decide our fate in terms of species on this planet. And this is arguably the most important person right now. Unfortunately, you cannot see the name of the author of this tweet. Uh, it's Dan Allen, the creator of Husky Doctor. He was saying something that I agree, which is that she is probably the most important person on the earth right now. She's actually doing something very important. And, uh, but, you know, we are 
dropping things, robots, all over the solar system right now. Um, and then we cry because of those robots. And then there's churches burning. And, uh, you know, they pledge to rebuild the church somehow. Uh, so I hope it works out well, uh, not unlike in the past. But the problem is that we cry more for those churches sometimes than for actual human beings having um, very difficult situations all over the world. And then we are flooded with information. We are flooded with news. We don't even take any more the time to actually analyze what's going on. And uh, that's not good. That's not good because we end up having arguments with ourselves. We are, end up arguing with each other. And that's not okay. We actually should be, you know, criticizing those who are actually breaking havoc. But then again, if ever a Soyuz capsule lands near you, uh, please be aware that there are IKEA-like instructions to open the capsule and get the astronauts out of it, because, you know, after a few months in space, it can be kind of complicated. And us developers, how do we fit in all this? Because the, the, the meaning of the Donald, the Donald, you know, we have to take back the definition of the Donald. And that takes me to my second story, which is, of course, code. Because we are developers. Right? And we have these projects going on, and we try to move uh, on these projects and somehow to survive. And we use great tools, absolutely fantastic tools, beautiful, some of them very expensive as well, to basically write loops. That's basically what we do. That's basically what the Turing machine is. It's a loop. And uh, we try to help our users the best way we can. And these users are delighted of discovering that basically the future is here. And then we find solutions to our problems in the most incredible ways. Sometimes when you're just sleeping and we apply the best <laughs> architectures that we can find at every single time. Of course, that is our job. That's what we do. And basically, our jobs haven't changed that much in the past 25 years. Actually, uh, I, I argue that our jobs haven't changed that much in probably 50, 60, 70 years. Um, we are still dealing with the same issues as always, you know, tabs versus spaces. Uh, Paul, if you're watching, we love you. And we still have to somehow update our updates so that we can update the updates of the updater. And then you end up that, no, you don't have enough space for the gigabytes. And you don't have enough space to update Xcode. OK, why not? But there's JavaScript, thankfully. We live in such an abstraction world that now we have JavaScript. That, and we can write, you know, Electron apps, and Electron apps are basically for, uh, it's, an, it's a chat app framework. Everybody knows about that. Now we have plenty of chat apps written with it. And uh, we forgot in the process that the actual point of Electron and of all of these frameworks was actually user experience. We forgot about that. Somehow it got diluted in the whole uh, discussion. And I think it should be back because, we're, you know, it's debatable whether users want web experiences or not. Uh, some people like Ben are actually arguing that um, it's not the case, not everybody wants. Actually, Ben wishes the whole React Native affair was over already. He's like, it's already over? Like, not yet. No, not yet. Um, and yeah, and people are asking, what is the kind of problems that React Native solves? Are we using the right tools? Uh, really? Maybe not. I don't know. Then there are web apps that you can make using these technologies. Some of them are progressive, some of them are regressive. And uh, you can, these days is incredible. You can actually use assembly. Uh, literally, you can compile Doom and run it on a browser if you want. You can, you can have discussions on the web then, because the web as well is a whole set of different tools. And basically, people are arguing whether they're doing it right or not. And there's a lot of discussion going on. And now you have uh, the earth, earth, earth flatters of the web, like my friend Maximiliano calls them. And then you have to basically fix problems on Internet Explorer. So Susana, I'm sorry about this. But I know, I know, the, I know the pain. Uh, but now, in the future, we're going to have you know these lenses to be able to navigate JavaScript code, and we're going to be able to deploy incredibly complex JavaScript applications uh, that basically we can even print them if we want. And I'm pretty sure we are going to end up sending some JavaScript to the moon anyway at some point. But you know, there used to be this very neat tool which was C. C was a neat tool. It was cross-platform. 
You can, this morning we've seen you can use, uh, you can use C++ to create uh, you know, cross-platform apps. <laughs> we've seen that. So it's a great tool. I mean, why not using it, right? C++ and, and POSIX as well. I mean, this is a long discussion. It's something, POSIX is, a, is an idea that is already almost 50 years old, and it got completely forgotten somehow. Uh, but C++ is a great thing. C++ is great. You can build incredible new things. It's changed a lot, the language, in the past few years. And you've got these error messages that look like, you know, um, a dog barfing at you, and you're like, Lassie, where's Lassie? Is Timmy okay? Stop barfing at me. And, uh, you know, it's like, well, what the hell? What is, what is it that we're even talking about right here, right, with these errors? And you've got all of these initializers, and unfortunately, I couldn't get autoplay, but I'm going to leave this. No, doesn't work. There we go. But, yeah, who cares? There's patterns. You know, and we use our tools the best way we can to create our systems, and then we create user interfaces. This is another great topic as well, and um, you end up with Clippy. And for those of you who were in my talk in 2016, maybe you remember Clippy. Well, I brought him back. I, lo I love Clippy. So here you go. Maybe Clippy one day will uh, help us fix merge requests, particularly, excuse me, uh, merge conflicts, particularly with storyboards, which is usually a problem. But it all depends on your merging strategy, right? And here, Hisham has it very clearly. It looks like a, a match of chess. <laughs> you know? And every time you join a new team, it's, it goes like this. Like, so, no, no, well, we use uh, the release and then big bug fix, and then no, we don't follow the Git flow standard. OK, well. And then there's the cloud. Incredible. The cloud, you don't even know where is your code running inside of a container, inside of <laughs> Kubernetes, inside of a virtual machine, inside of Amazon, inside of somewhere in the data center. It could be in Mars, for all you know. And uh, well, remember, that I, remember to turn off the services in Amazon that you don't use, because it, right? Then, how do you manage security? It's kind of a problem. You know, thankfully, there are companies <laughs> managing those things for you. And, uh, and then we release our apps. And uh, it gets so complex because now you are continuously, there's this continuous delivery thing going on. So you have to release apps probably several times a day. So what do you do? Bug fix. Bug fix. And then you are, oh, we have this little bug bunny who's <laughs> touching our bugs and we give them carrots. Yeah, why not? Uh, and then we still have the problem of developing those apps, you know, and as Carol pointed out, uh, everything is problematic with auto layout, actually. <laughs> so, and that, this is a comment from 2013, so it hasn't really changed. Uh, then let's not even talk about Android developers, because th this is a completely different problem for them. They have the libraries in their devices that don't really work. And then there's always somebody, you know, particularly the, the, the old dogs like myself, that, you know, we still wish for, you know, Objective-C 3.0. For what? As soon as you tweet this, somebody is going to, t to tell that you're a dinosaur. You know, very respectfully. Mm, very, very respectfully, but if you don't use this. And we get, once again, what I said previously, we get once again into this argument among ourselves. Why? Why do we need to go into these arguments? And you know what? Life goes uh, by very fast. All of a sudden, you're 22, 23, you move to your girlfriend. Unfortunately, I cannot play the movie, but it's basically the dog poof, bah, clapping on the head of the man. And, uh, and then you're 35, and by the age of 35, you're wearing t-shirts about technologies that don't longer exist. And the younger on your teams, I'm like, oh, you did that? I read about that on a book. And, uh, and there's a problem with ageism. I feel it. I'm 45, and somehow uh, I got refused job offers because of my age. It, hap it happened to me. And uh, so it is a kind of a problem. We are kind of going back in time, and then we, we hear uh, younger developers sometimes coming with great ideas that we've already heard before. So we try very politely to say, yeah, you know what? We know about that. Thank you so much. It's been written in 1972, by the way. Um, but age, it's a positive thing. And it, I think we should be actually caring about age. Like here in this case, you can see about Pelé saying clearly that they could totally beat uh, the team of Argentina. And I totally believe what he says. Right? There you go. This is for my Brazilian friends right there. Uh, we have such a problem with age and time in our industry. We don't. We publish blog posts without dates. Who publishes blog posts without dates? Right here. Raise your hand. Ah, you don't want to. You don't want to. Ah, I saw a hand over there. Don't do that. But the, the problem, you know, it's actually older. It begins with research papers. Research papers without 
dates. It's something that I cannot understand why it happens. And, and then you end up with myths popping up, because the internet is great for myths. <laughs> right? And some things in the past, if they had evolved into the modern world, could have been actually useful, you know, like a Vim car. You cannot get out of it if, the, if it ever gets stolen. Um, but you know, what am I doing right here? I'm making puns, I'm traveling around the world, and I'm giving speeches. I'm actually not helping. I'm actually not helping. So what I'm trying to do is basically to mentor other people. I'm trying to criticize things that hurt others, and ourselves, and myself as well. Because it's also my job as a senior engineer to basically explain our legacy code bases to all of the junior engineers that join our team, right? And then, where do we go? Well, I guess I will have to find a job in a telecom industry, because apparently that's where everybody goes. So I, I guess my next job will be in the telecom industry somehow. And, uh, but you know what? Even worse than being an old guy is being a woman. It's unfortunate. A lady makes the first photograph of a black hole and there's a whole community in Reddit that have nothing else to do but to actually say that basically she most probably not, haven't done it. Uh, seriously, like this is our community as well. This is unfortunate, but it's also the world we're living in. Um, and then there's Swift, of course. Swift, which uh, is somehow related to C++, according to Joe. And uh, there's a lot of people that you know, are asking some questions that are valid, I think, about whether we needed Swift in the first place. It's a great language, but maybe we could have fixed other things uh, inside of the tools that we use every day, right? Why not? Uh, and Swift hasn't solved all the problems. <laughs> the nullability problems are still there, somehow. <laughs> and. Uh, and yeah, and then there are people who really don't like Swift. You know, Swift is a nightmare language, loudness, process complexity. And again, we're arguing among ourselves. It's like, seriously, we shouldn't be doing this. And you know, um, then there's somebody who used Swift on the server, and whatever happened, they didn't like it. So it's like, oh, Swift. So there's this fueling these conversations, all of that. It's kind of complicated. And then somebody comes up and says, ah, let's use Haskell. And Haskell is great, <laughs> because all you have to do is stick one devon inside of a terminal, and it yields reverse functions. Fantastic, let's do that. Let's all use Haskell for our next application. Now, you can always create a new language. So here's a simple guide for those of you who would like to create the next programming language. Uh, this is really useful. You know what you have to do. And then, if you want to choose the name of the function that gives the length of an array, here to help you as well, whatever we need. Now, the, 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 the important take here in my story is that software is actually about people. So it doesn't matter what the name of your function is, what the, the syntax of your language basically is. I think we have to go back to other values. We have to look a little bit behind uh, all of that and actually find the developer that is working with all of those tools, which takes me to my next subject, which is work. And work usually happens on an open space. It's very unfortunate. Uh, you come to your new office, and basically it's an open space. and. Uh, David Heinemar Hansen has to basically make polls on the internet, make polls on Twitter, so that people can vote and say, yeah, I don't like open spaces, which are totally right. Uh, and uh, I figure out, watching a documentary on TV, that basically uh, jewelry is made, you know, jewelry worth millions, is made in very small places, very silent, so you can concentrate. And we are thrown in football table filled rooms, you know? And yeah. You have to go back to our cubicles and be creative. It's complicated. And then we end up you know, with actual studies that show if you put a lot of people inside of a room for a long period of time, the level of CO2 is so big that you shouldn't be taking decisions in that room because your ability to take decisions is diminished. Uh, yet, that's exactly what happens in those places without open spaces. So maybe we, there's an argument for open spaces. Who knows? But thankfully, now technology is catching up. You can make phone calls in open spaces. This is an actual thing. You can buy this, by the way. <laughs> it all goes down to budgets. As my friend Fernando once said, this is the budget on the bottom. This is exactly what they want 
It's on the top, not the same, right? Uh, it, it all comes down to that. This is a big reason why we end up in those open spaces. It's because there's not enough money. But the truth is, we get angry against ma our direct managers. But you know what? Our direct managers are also human beings. And they are what we call in Argentina the ham in the sandwich. You're basically compressed between the developers on one side and the upper management on the other. Do they have room to take the decisions that we would like them to take? Sometimes not. So maybe we're also getting angry with the wrong people as well. Um, but then again, who are the ones getting you know, bad reviews in our corporations? Who are the ones who are late? Well, we are always the ones being blamed for late projects. It's unfortunate, but that's the way it is. And uh, not the salesmen who promised something that couldn't be done. Then there's recruiting. And recruiting is a big problem all of it itself, because basically we all see these uh, job offers where they ask you to have PhDs and 10 years on a programming language that exists since yesterday, these kind of things. And, um, and then there's this idea that there's not enough people. There's not enough people. And then you have actually very competent developers who cannot find job, and it's like, no, I cannot find any. I cannot find anyone. Yeah, no, the people are there. You just don't want to see that. And recruiters, finally, they don't know exactly what to do to lure you into those jobs. You know, they try to push you somehow uh, to get into these companies. But they are not providing the right information. Marion is right. Exactly the things that we need to know about our jobs, which is the salary and the, the days of holidays and so on. We don't get that information. And yeah, the whole recruiting industry is... A train wreck, literally. Uh, but you know how we can change that? It change, that change to the recruiting industry, it starts not with the recruiters, it starts not with recruiting managers, it starts with you guys, with us, with me, with all of us. We can change. Um, it is never a one-way interview. When you go for a job interview, it's never a one-way discussion. The recruiter doesn't have all the power. Okay? Unfortunately, some, some of us, sometimes we are on the recruiting side. So we end up creating these false expectations during recruitment, right? It's not, I mean, seriously, <laughs> let's be honest about our jobs when we recruit people. And uh, for interviewees, don't get into these kind of situations. <laughs> Because it's not positive either. We are not actually helping here. Uh, what actually, yes, is helpful is these kind of situations where you actually go to an interview and say, can I see the code? I can sign an NDA if you want. I love NDAs. That's another discussion, but that's another problem. But let me, show, let, let me see the code. Let me see the team. How do they talk to one another? Are they respectful to one another? Do they work well? Does the team do testing? Why don't we ask those questions when we go? You know, when next time they tell you, do you have any questions? Take a pointer from here and start asking the questions that hurt. Because we have to do that as interviewees when we go looking for jobs. And to Pete, if you're watching Pete, we love you. Uh, this is also very important. Sometimes when you hire senior engineers, you can have a conversation as well, because some people have been in the battlefield for a long time, so you can as well learn something from them, even if you don't hire them in any case. Uh, let us be very clear about this. Companies are not here to help. They have one big objective, which is to make money, and it will be done on your back. It's unfortunate, but that's how it, way it is. So, I'm a big, big proponent of unionization. I would love to have a union of software developers. I know that this is a very, very delicate topic for many people. I think we need to unionize. I need to protect the younger developers coming into the industry, provide them the support and tell them, we are here for you guys, it's okay to provide support to the discussions of salaries. Here in Switzerland, the developer salaries are going down. The offers I've been getting in the past two years, the salaries are going down. Why? I don't know. Is there a union to protect us? Not really. Then, there's the way we work. 
A lot of companies are against distributed teams, like seriously, deeply, deeply distributed teams. Uh, they, they just don't want to hear about it. They want you to drive or to take a train and to spend those seven, eight hours every day in front of your computer uh, in any case. But then again, all of the other services are gone somewhere else. You don't know, sometimes to India, sometimes to China, sometimes to somewhere else. And uh, basically, we have to be there in front of our computers for seven hours. And then we end up with situations like this. Like, seriously, these guys from Revolut, I don't, probably you've seen this tweet of this guy posting in Slack saying that people who don't reach uh, their targets will be fired immediately without negotiation. Like, seriously, <laughs> who do you think you are? I, the, the, the normal situation here would have been to have a, a union coming in and saying, you know what? Now we leave all of us. Thank you so much and good luck with your company. That's the only rational answer that you can have to this kind of bullying, because this is bullying. And uh, people who are working independently don't have it either, uh, either way much easier, because basically this is the typical interaction that you have with many, many, many customers all over the place, you know? They come, they tell you, mm, you're too expensive, and then they come two months later or two years later, mm, can you help us fix this mess? And they want to pay you an exposure box. Ah, but think about all the exposure you're going to get. Of course, I'm going to use that exposure to pay my rent, right? And, uh, but in any case, they will send you a LinkedIn invitation. In any case, you're going to have a LinkedIn invitation. And there's this very nice song uh, from LinkedIn Park. Uh, but hey, we are agile. We are agile. So basically, uh, you're going to be oppressed, but with colors and... Uh, and uh, football tables, because, hey, you got a football table, uh, why not, right? Um, then we're going to have this whole agile thing, you know, it's a whole discussion we could have, but this is very often as well the case. You've got people with Scrum certifications uh, who basically don't know anything about software engineering, and you have to explain them how software engineering works, even how a compiler works, and you're like, seriously, no, I mean, I understand that Scrum is not the project management framework, it's actually... But, like, seriously, we, we, don't, we, don't, we cannot work properly here. And then, how do you grow in your career? What is the end point of a, of a career? To be a podcast host? Because you know what a podcast is. A podcast is basically two, two white males uh, talking uh, together. That's what a podcast is. So apparently that's the only solution. Well, there's another one, which is CTO, right? So apparently you can become a CTO. But it's, yeah, it's like, seriously, it's the only thing we can do. You know? In some companies, we were talking about some companies that basically push their developers into management roles. But I don't know. Somehow, it's, there's not a real discussion. There's no standard in the industry. No, nobody cares about this. And then you, you go into these jobs, and you have to use Slack to be productive, and you use Discord to uh, basically uh, build communities, right? Why not? And PDF still takes half of the RAM on your memory, uh, of, uh, of the, the, the RAM of your, of your machine just to load the PDF, and still CD is not loading uh, Xcode when you want it. <laughs> right? I mean, seriously. What's the problem? And this takes me to the next point, which is catastrophes. Because all of this situation, we end up with you know, software that for the past 50 years has tried to do things, and we are pushing this technology into directions that shouldn't be going, and then you end up with very weird situations, like Silicon Valley is like the Soviet Union right now. You know, you have to wait for years for a car that barely works, and you're promised that you're going to be walking on the moon in any time soon. It's exactly the same thing they were telling uh, to people in the Soviet Union back in the 60s. Mm, we are spending money in projects that maybe don't have uh, much reason to be. But we've got April Fool's jokes, why not? You know, but Google Reader, no, we don't need that. And then you end up with the impression that this whole world is a conspiracy. It's a conspiracy, it's actually big powers. This is the fault of Zuckerberg. Zuckerberg actually wants to, no, it's not that. It's just that we're doing everything and we are uh, idolizing these entrepreneurs somehow, that they think that working 200 hours a week is actually a good thing. It's not. It is not. It is not a good idea. And great guy, DHH. I like this guy. 
And then there are laptops and courage, you know, and the product of laptops and courage is unfortunate uh, laptops that sometimes don't really live up to expectations, so you feel like the whole quality of these things are going down. We were talking with you, uh, Marcin, a couple of hours ago about this is perceived quality of these things that, you know, very slowly sleeping. And then people who were hardcore Mac developers, you know, looking elsewhere, maybe I th should get a ThinkPad or whatnot and this and that. And, uh, and then there's DHH once again, I love this guy, who actually makes a poll online to ask people, do you have problems with your keyboards, with the MacBook, the MacBook keyboards? And it turns out that 66% of the people uh, have had problems with the people, 66% of those who answered, of course. And it makes me wish we could go back to simpler times, you know? The, the keyboards actually worked very well back then. They were a bit bulky, I give you that. Um, then there's plastic, apparently, this industry we are working in, you know, all these laptops and smartphones, they came wrapped and wrapped and wrapped and wrapped in layers and layers and layers of plastic and foam and God, God knows what. And um, it raises questions regarding the state of the world. And, but then again, we go back to the old arguments between ourselves. We basically argue among ourselves whether, you know, Samsung or Qualcomm is right to ask for $10 for uh, each device to Apple, uh, when actually there are other questions that we should be probably be asking about what we're doing every day with our work. And there comes to the realization that all businesses want to be banks these days. And you get a credit card that Patrick Bateman could be using, for those of you who remember American Psycho. That is. Very weird things. And, uh, you know, companies that we actually trusted a lot about security, they can sleep as well. Very little, they can sleep sometimes. It's like, ah, sorry, didn't mean to. No, no, it's okay. Keep on, move on. Then there's the whole economy, the new economy, the disruption we're getting. We are getting Uber and Lyft forcing departures to be left in arrivals and arrivals in departures in the SFO airport. Yeah, way to go. Fantastic, the new economy, I love it. And then there's cryptocurrencies, of course, this is the future. And this is great because in this case, uh, basically the, the guy who had the password to all of the accounts died. So you know what, I'm sorry, you just lost $150 million worth of cryptocurrencies. And this is true news, this happened. Uh, and let me remind you <laughs> something that Scott Chacon said yesterday morning about the blockchain for dogs, remember that? Yeah, perfect, that was it. Because the important thing to take here is that actually, what is the impact of what we're doing? Do we measure this? We don't. Maybe some of us have Bitcoin, a little bit of Ethereum here and there, Litecoin, whatever the name. Do we think about these things? Not really, yet. At some point, I guess many of us bought uh, a few graphic cards to do some uh, crypto mining and these kind of things. And you know what? There's, it, it, it gets really weird because afterwards Apple publishes an article, uh, excuse me, a, a guidance reference, finance guidance reference, saying that demand for iPhones will grow as temperatures rise because of climate change because you can use them as flashlights. And you're like, seriously? <laughs> you're betting on this? Okay, and companies buy companies, so we get worried about that as well. Uh, I hope, hopefully, GitHub will not run the same. Uh, uh, Scott Jagon is in the, in the room, I don't know. Uh, and then you've got what? You've got taxis scanning the faces of passengers so that they can target advertising for you. Advertising all the time. People want to basically sell you things all the time. By the way, this is a small word from our sponsors. The Programmatica Ipsum, the magazine that talks about software engineering this month, talks about work. You can follow it in the Ipsum in Twitter at theprogrammaticaipsum.com. Thank you so much. Back to our regularly scheduled program. There's Twitter as well, because social media is a completely different problem. It's a completely different issue. Uh, you, you, you end up with, you know, people with w very weird conversations online. Everybody's like, you know, in, in about five minutes, you go from, wow, it's awesome, I hate you. It's like, seriously, how long did it take? Like, two hours. Two hours it took. Um, and then you go from Instagram, where everybody's life is perfect, to Twitter, where everybody's miserable. So you're like, there's no middle point here, you know? It's like, and in Facebook, you know that they, they, they are basically, don't use Facebook. Um, and now, 
Even if you have 10, influ 10 followers, you can be a Zepto influencer, you could be a Nato influencer, and your influence is so small that it becomes negligible compared to the nuclear force, right? And, um, but then go, people go to bookstores, they scan the ISBN codes of the books, and they buy them on Amazon, and then they brag online about these kind of things. And then the bookstore have to get out and publish a tweet saying, please, you know, it's like, if you find a book that you like, buy it from us, because otherwise we won't be here next year. And uh, this is happening right now, right here. And you know that Amazon is very well known because it's one of the biggest contributors to the IRS, right? I mean, it's, a, it's an incredible provider of money um, to the American government or any other government to a, and then we defend, middle class people have this very weird tendency to defend rich people because, but you know what, it's like you are undermining your own social tissue, you are undermining your own society by doing that. Wealthy people don't need any of our help, neither do corporations, and this is something that you can read in history books, this is something that all the historians have said for centuries, we can go back and read some of the classics of the 19th century, of the 18th century, and you're going to see that they are painfully relevant these days. And um, we, I mean, for example, we've known about climate change since 1912. We've known that it could happen. 1912, before World War I. But you know, it's frustrating, but that's the way things are sometimes. But there's hope. There's hope. And this is my fifth story and my last story of the day. And it all starts with us. Because we are the ones making apps. We are the ones deciding where to work and who to work with. And we have a lot of power. We have a lot of leverage in this industry. We have knowledge. And knowledge is power. So we have to use that power responsibly. We have to take the decision of not working on com in companies that are actually behaving unethically. It's something that we have to do. We have to take those decisions, not do it. And tell others, you know what, please, don't go there. I understand you have a mortgage, you have probably a kid, it's okay. I, I will not judge. But if at all possible, try to look at your future employer. Choose wisely. There is leverage. We have leverage. Denounce what's going on. This Actually, true. Facebook raising complaints against somebody who dared going on the stage of TED and talking against Facebook. And the Facebook representatives were in front row watching it, not saying a word, as people clapped awkwardly in the back. This is an incredible story. Please look it up and find it because it's really, really important. And then, whatever devices it is that you're using, please be aware of whatever is going on on those devices. If you use them, fine, but at least be aware of what's going on. And let us not build a world where human contact is becoming a luxury good. I was shocked when I read this, message, this article in the, in the New York Times. But this is actually shocking. We've built a world where only rich people can actually afford having the luxury of talking to a human being. Can you imagine how fortunate we are that we can gather here and we have actually, we can meet in person. We can, you know, go and have a beer and talk and laugh. Well, go read this article as well, because it's becoming a luxury. What we have here, we are extremely privileged of this moment. This moment, it's a privilege. Let's understand socialism. Let's understand capitalism. When we say, oh, this is socialism, this is capitalism, let's understand what it's on. Let's read Marx. Let's go back to the basics. Let's understand what we're talking about. And let us ask ourselves the question, how much is earning the person who's taking you in their Uber? Are they able to afford a school for their children? Are they able to afford the smartphone to basically work for Uber? Are they able to pay the rent? Are they able to eat at the end of the month? I was in Buenos Aires a couple of weeks ago, and they have this service which is uh, like Deliveroo. You can basically use an app to ask for food. And basically, three uh, drivers of motorbikes in the city of Buenos Aires were killed in one week, in the middle of April, uh, delivering food for people. And they don't even have a minimum salary. They earn 
per, com per request, basically, and they, it's, uh, it's, it's appalling. It's appalling. And this is Argentina, which apparently used to be kind of a not-so-bad place at some point. As tech people, we have to start looking around us. We have to start paying attention to the world that we're building. We have to start opening our eyes and figuring out, and then take a decision. I'm not going to judge, I'm no one to judge the decision that you take, but at least let's take decisions consciously about um, the things we build on the world. For example, there's a CEO who decided that the facial recognition technology they were building was so good that they actually decided not to sell it to certain governments. It's a decision you can take. There's people on the board of Microsoft saying we need regulation. The industry needs regulation. This is going in any direction. It's not good. There are very good books coming out right now that are asking the question, saying, what is this world we designed? Like Mike Montero's Ruined by Design. The, says, the title says it all. And please, let's vaccinate our children and... <laughs> Try not, and I'm going to zoom on this because it's awesome, and I ask you all of you to read this uh, answer on Quora, that basically somebody's asking, uh, my kids are unvaccinated, which, uh, which uh, oils could I spread on them? And basically the idea is to spread uh, fermented Swedish herring on top of their bodies so everybody stays away from your kids with, with missiles. <laughs> Seriously, no, th this shouldn't happen. This shouldn't be like this. And I believe... I think that DHH, once again, is right right here. We need an oath. It's a stupid thing. You know, doctors have it. Lawyers have it. Maybe we should, you know, put our right hand on top of our heart or you know, the left hand, I don't know which one, and then you raise your hand and you say, I swear not to do harm when I, when I see it. I try to avoid it. I behave ethically. Maybe we need that. At the end of school, you know, you end up your computer science school and somebody comes up to you, please stand up and swear that at least you will not harm. Primum non nocere, said the Latin 2,000 years ago when they described ethics. And of course, as developers, we still can make the world a simple place, you know, making smaller apps, more simple apps. Let's go back to the basics on that respect. You know, there's plenty of nice architectures, but sometimes you can go a, a, a lot of places with just the basics. And uh, we can actually take care of accessibility as well. We can take care of user experience. We can actually force the marketing teams to actually give a shit about what is going on with the people using our applications. We have that power. We have to use it. We have to be responsible in that respect. Because everything is sustained from below. Everything is sustained by us making apps. We are the ones making this digital world. You make your websites, you make your apps, you make your Docker containers, you make all of that infrastructure, and that thing is changing the world. We are changing the world, and we are the ones supporting this. But do not overwork, because that's another problem. Don't overdo. Go home, have fun with your kids, with your cat. Have a life. It's important. You know, do your 40 hours a week, whatever it is that the law tells you to do, but then leave it out behind. And very, very importantly, please, let us be kind to one another. Let us not have fights with one another because we are not the problem. We are the solution. We have the power to change the way things are. And all of the, those catastrophes I've mentioned, we can actually do something about them. I would like to thank all of the... Well, basically, yeah, and in the, in, the, in the end, we are going to still having to deal with uh, VS Code in the meanwhile. I'm sorry about that. But I would like to thank all of the unwilling Twitter users that provided me with the tweets I've used in this slide. And thank you so much, because you've been a wonderful audience. Thank you so much. Yeah.